copies of the scriptures to Ephesians and chapter 1. We'll be starting through the passage that Paul has written here from verses 3 through 14. We'll read the whole doxology together, uh, but the sermon will just focus on verses 3 through 7. Ephesians chapter 1, beginning in verse 3. Blessed and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him in love. He predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will to the praise of his glorious grace, with which he has blessed us in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth, in him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, so that we who were first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your graciousness in providing your word to us. We thank you for these words particularly. And we ask that you would send your Holy Spirit in and among us that we would be able to see your truth in these words and not just human words. We ask that you would encourage our hearts, build us up in the faith that you have delivered to the saints. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, the Ephesian church was a very young church weren't like the church at Jerusalem where people had been following God their entire lives and people knew the scriptures and had massive sections of it committed to memory. And then Jesus was revealed, showed them the truth of how that applied to him, and they had this vast lifetime of experience with the word of God to draw on. These people had two years with the apostle Paul before he left them and had to to flee for his life. And he knew that they would soon be facing trouble from people who had known God for much longer, who believed those things that the Jews believed and had followed Jesus, maybe, at least in word, but still put great value in the ceremonies of the Old Testament, in the physical keeping of the ceremonial law and the civil law that was put on the Jews and would want to extend that into Christ's kingdom and bring them under bondage to the law. Paul being in prison had no way that he could go to them. And even if he weren't in prison, it's very possible he would have been drawn by God to work somewhere else. So instead of coming to them or fretting, he sends them this letter from their God to encourage them. And as he does that, he opens up not with a statement of his worries and concerns, not with a statement of just how tough it might be for them in the coming years, but instead he pours out praise to the God he knows will take care of his church. And so he pours out this heaping up of words in praise of God. And if you've ever talked to an excited child, they just let out a stream of words, seemingly without any need to breathe, for minutes on end. And that's kind of what Paul has done here. Uh, What we have here is the longest real sentence, uh, the second longest sentence in the scriptures, uh, all the way from verse 3 to 4. Through 14, everything we read uh, was one single sentence in the Greek. Uh, People have commented on the fact that this sentence is the most complex, hardest thing to read and parse out and divide neatly uh, in Greek, period. Um, Paul has layered up this beautiful set of dependent clauses. uh, And if you like sentence diagramming, by the way, I have diagrams that you can look at. Uh, If you don't, don't worry about it. Um, But Paul has made this complex 
glorification of God that just goes and goes and goes, showing his excitement and his joy in his God. Now this week, we're going to look at the opening portion of doxology, and then we're going to go through the things that lead up to our salvation, the ways that God worked before we even knew him to bring us to salvation. And then next week, we'll pick up, uh, starting again in verse 7 uh, and going through 14, showing the benefits that we have in salvation. And you'll notice I'm doing 7 today and 7 next week. Uh, people have spent 1,900 years or so and change uh, trying to divide this passage neatly in ways that could be just grasped and held. And everyone agrees that everyone else has gotten it wrong. Um, so here's what we're doing here. It's not perfect, but it'll work for us. So first of all, this morning, we're going to look at blessing God in the first part of verse 3. Then we're going to look at the way that he has blessed us. And this blessing God and his blessing us is very much like the way that uh, we're told in 1 John that we love because he loved us. We bless God because he blessed us first. And so that's a, kind of what's going on here. Then we are going to look at how he has blessed us by choosing or predestining us in verses 4 through 6. And then we'll come to verse 7, where we'll see that he has blessed us in providing what we need for our salvation. So first of all, Paul says in verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. He is praising the Father, who is the object of our worship, uh, because our Lord Jesus Christ also recognized him and revealed him. And he is giving a blessing to God. Now, if you're like me, you might be thinking in the back, but the writer of Hebrews said, with exception, the greater blesses the lesser. How is Paul blessed? And the reason we can bless God is because there are four different ways that the word blessing is used in the scripture. Uh, first of all, what we have here, and by the way, I didn't think of these on my own. Calvin wrote these down hundreds of years ago. They're very helpful. Uh, for what we have here is glorifying God. Not that we make God any greater by blessing him. Not that we give to him anything that he didn't have beforehand. But we, goodness, his greatness, his wonder recognized. We bring it up as a topic for conversation. We proclaim it before people, giving him the glory he deserves. We also see blessing as God showing kindness to men. When he gives them grace that they didn't earn, as we're going to see throughout this passage and throughout this book, or when he gives them success in their labors, that is God's blessing on others also described as blessing each other when we come before our God and pray for each other. When a brother or sister has a need and we go before the face of God and intercede for them and call out to him, have mercy on them, that is a blessing we can put on one another. And then lastly, in what's being written in the book of Hebrews, when I say without exception, the greater blesses the lesser, are the benedictions of the apostles and the priests, those who God has anointed and set blessings on his people. And we have ordained ministers for that as well who can proclaim God's blessings that exist in his people and announce them over them. That's why when I read the benediction, I'm not an ordained minister, but a benediction that Paul put on the church, or here is a benediction that Aaron, the whole community of God, these are blessings that God has announced for his people through the words of other men. And so Paul moves to bless God, but without going any further than that, he moves to announce why God should be blessed. And he says he is blessing God in the second half of verse 3, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. And people have argued about the definition of exactly what these spiritual blessings are. What is their nature? What is their content? How much of what we have is blessings in the heavenly places. And basically, it's everything. It is absolutely every good thing that we have. Everything that is good in us, that someone could see in us and say, hey, 
That is a good person, a person who is aligned with the God of the universe, a person who is wise or a person who has understanding or love or kindness or goodness. All of those things come from God. And not for no reason, they come to us in Christ. These aren't blessings that God just indiscriminately pours out on everyone, but these are blessings that were purchased for us by our Savior. He won them for us, so we have them as an inheritance, as we'll talk about next week. But we praise God because he has given us every good thing. There's nothing we can lay our hands on in our lives. The aspect of our person, something about us, and say, I have created this for myself. I am the only authority, the person this good thing. We have to recognize it is God who has done everything good and accomplished everything good and given us everything good. Then about how God has been good, especially in leading up to our salvation. Reading verses four through six, it says, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him in love. He predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace with which he has blessed us in the beloved. So even as he's going through talking about these things that God has done, he can't help but again announce that it's to the praise of his glory, that it's in Christ, that these things are being accomplished in and because of Christ. And notice the timing of when God chose to do this. Verse 4 says, he chose us in him before of the world. So kids who have the coloring page, you'll notice the praising hands and are to the left of the world. Before the world was even made, God had chosen to love his people, to be kind to them. And that points to part of what's going on here, that God is ultimately the first mover. He is the first one to move in salvation in the goodness of his people. We don't as sinners choose our God, but he chooses us and makes us his. He doesn't do that for no reason. He doesn't choose his people and then just leave them to be going out and doing whatever they please. But specifically, we're told here that he has chosen us that we should be holy and blameless before him in love. So first of all, he says that we should be holy, that we are a people who are to be set apart from the world, who are to be drawn aside and set apart for the worship of God uniquely among all men, we would worship him. Like him in Christ, that we would worship him. And so this holiness is a spiritual part that separates us. When we come to Christ, we find ourselves with some of the sins, with some of the worldly things that we loved so much beforehand. And he has changed our hearts and made us like him. But it's not just an internal change. We're not just holy, but we're also be blameless. This is the idea of perfection, often in the Old Testament, is blamelessness. Not living a life of absolute moral purity, never sinning again. We're told in 1 John chapter 1, anyone who says they haven't sinned is a liar, and the truth isn't in them. This is living blamelessly. Noticing when sin is brought up before you, when someone says, hey, you did this against me. You stole from me. You didn't mean to, but you deprived me of good. Or you spoke evil of me without cause. It was true. When we do these things, we repent. Not that we can never speak in anger against our neighbor or against us. Not that we ever where we have no sin and never hurt anyone again. It's the fact that when we sin, we turn, we live blameless left where someone can accuse us because whenever an accusation is brought against us, we repent or show that it was untrue. But that is living a blameless life. And God adds to that that this blameless life should be lived before him in love. Now there is some debate, does the in love, and depending on your translation, uh, it will either attach in love to walking before God or in love to God predestining us in the next verse. 
and grammatically it can go either way. Uh, the reason I attach it here to the walking before God, uh, there are several of them. Uh, first of all, whenever Paul talks about love or walking in love, um, well, just generally love, um, in the opening of his epistles, it's always in relation to the people, not in relation to God. Grace and peace from God, but then love for the brethren. Uh, the other thing is the entire second half of this verse or second half of this book, is God showing us how to walk in love with one another. And so we have these blessings before him, walking blameless, but also we are to be walking as Christians in love. Now, ultimately, uh, just to give you some encouragement in being able to trust your translators, ultimately, these are both the case. We're going to see that God's predestining is in love, regardless of whether it's expressed here by the text. And regardless of whether we are commanded here to walk in love, we're commanded elsewhere in the scriptures that we should walk in love, that we should love because God loved us. And so either way, the scriptures are true. There is no, like, someone has the scriptures completely wrong and they're preaching a different gospel matter here. It's just where that goes in this passage. And I think it's particularly important that it goes with walking uh, holy and blameless lives because it is very easy for us as Christians to become proud, to think that we have something special or we are something special. And that's common to all men, to think that they, for any reason, are better than another. But here we have immediately joined on that high calling of our lives that we're to be walking these lives in love. We're not supposed to be thinking, you know, I have been made holy. I am blameless. I am all set. But we are to be loving each other and loving those God has brought into our lives and pouring love that he has for us out into the world, that the, the, the Christian life can never become a singular, inward-focused, ignoring everything outside of us type of thing, focusing on being holy ourselves, being blameless ourselves, uh, even those who aren't proud uh, but are fearful, looking inward and worrying and worrying and worrying, but looking outward is the way we are to be directed as Christians. Paul then moves into verse 5 saying he predestined us, that is, he decided beforehand to, that this would be happening, that we would be adopted to himself as sons through Christ. And this is a beautiful and wonderful thing. I think everyone is familiar with the idea of adoption, that someone who does not have a family, uh, or whose family is unaware of them, can be brought in and made a member of a new family. Not a, a partial member, not a honorary member, but a real and true part of that family. And what many people in modern times don't think about is that adoption was different than our adoption. Now, our adoption, uh, kids become our kids just like any others of our kids. Uh, and a threat that parents used to use on children, I don't know if anyone still does, is, you know, if you don't behave, you're going to the orphanage. And that was a very real threat in Rome. Anyone who didn't live up to their parents' noble expectations could be just cut off and sent away, and they were done. And that was especially a threat because adoption was very common in ancient Rome, not even to take people who are completely cut off or without parents, but to take someone who is honorable or good, a good kid somewhere else, or even a good adult, and say, this is now my heir. This is my son. I'm, I'm taking this person as my child. Uh, but in Roman adoption, while you could cut off any of your natural children, an adopted child could never be cut off. Never. And so when God says, I have adopted you, this is written in the Roman culture to people who lived in the Roman culture with the Roman understanding of adoption, both in Paul and his readers, this adoption that he is giving, this bringing us into being his children, brothers and sisters of Christ, children of the This is something that can never be undone, can never be taken away, can never be... Uh, lost. It is something that is given for keeps. And he adopts us, not just in general, but adopts us as sons. Uh, in Rome, generally, 
the only ones who could inherit, the only ones who could have benefit directly from the things of the parent at their demise, are the sons. And so the word used for adoption here also includes the word sons, that we are adopted as sons, that man or woman, boy or girl, when we are adopted into Christ's family, when we are adopted as children of the Father, we have all the rights given to all of us. There are no greater or lesser followers of Jesus. There are no people who have all of the rights that God gives and then some secondary people who have a little bit but can't come all the way. But everyone who is brought to his family is brought in all the way forever to give. Now there are some troubles with talking about choosing or predestining the way that God works before time to make us his people. And that trouble kind of comes out of the scriptures because we're told here, again and again, God chose, God predestined according to his will. But we're also told that we as humans are responsible for choosing. We must choose to repent, that we must choose to follow God. And as humans have wrestled with these two facts of the scriptures, <clears throat> a variety of ways to harmonize come out. Each of them has its pros and cons, and I'm going to work going through these thoughts that people have had from the worst to the best. And the first thought people have for dealing with this is the universalists. They say, God is God is He doesn't really mean the law stuff. Everybody is saved. And the pro there is that's really easy and it's nice to say to people. I mean, who can be offended when you say, hey, doesn't matter what you do, you're just fine. That's nice. Uh, the con to that position is it contradicts the scriptures. Even for believers, God has commanded that they be holy and blameless, that if we love Jesus, we'll keep his commandments. And he has proclaimed very sure things about the punishment or sin that people deserve. Jesus himself in his earthly ministry spoke more about hell than he did about heaven. And so we have to reject universalism. Pelagianism is one step better from there. And that is saying, that, you know, when Adam fall, fell, he didn't really fall. He's actually still pretty good and can do whatever he needs to to save himself. And that, again, is really nice to say to people. You know, hey, whatever you're doing, you can fix it yourself. Uh, there are massive sections in the bookstores that make a whole lot of money for a whole lot of people telling them exactly that. But again, it doesn't line up with the scriptures. It doesn't address the fact that we're told that we are dead in our sins. Not sick, not a little under the weather, but we're dead. It doesn't address the ways that we are told that we are given these good things when we were undeserving things for us, that we had no interest in God until he had interest in us. The next option people came to is semi-Pelagianism, which is Pelagianism light, trying to make it a little bit less contradictory to the scriptures, but also nice to say to people. And they basically say that, well, Adam did fall, and it's a real fall, and there is real sin, and that's a real problem, but for this one thing, choosing Christ, everyone has to, to do the right thing. But again, it doesn't match up in the God God. Just like Pelagianism has the same problems, that it is the goodness of Christ the choosing here in our passage of God that determines things. Another group says there's something called middle knowledge, that God, looking forward through time, saw who would trust him and who wouldn't trust him, and elected those who would trust him, chose them, and then uh, reprobated or decided against those who ultimately wouldn't have chosen him anyways. And there's a few problems with this. First of all, the meaning of the word choose um, is that the person doing Choosing is the person doing the choosing. The selection is made by that person. And another problem with that is the fact that all of us, when we were believers, would have made the wrong choice. 
We were all completely taken in our sins, happy in our sins, with no desire to leave them for the Lord our God, but we uh, enjoyed our sins. Some people talk about how when, as a Christian, they are going along through their life and they return to an old sin that they've hated, they use the scriptural reference of returning like a dog to their vomit. And that's not right. Unbelievers return to their sins like a dog to its vomit. It's their nature. The dog isn't like, oh, this is entirely gross. I hate it, but I'm going to eat it anyways. This smells And that is how we all are apart from Christ, without God acting in us to make us have an interest in him. That's where we would all be and where we would all stay. None of us can say, I would have made the right choice. It is all of God's grace. Then lastly, we come to the Reformed view. On the bright side, it aligns with the words of Scripture. Just looking through what we have here in our passage, verse 4 says, He chose us in him. Then look in verse 5, it says, He predestined us for adoption. And at the end of verse 5, it says, According to the purpose of His will. Not according to His future, it would happen, but according to His purpose and His will. And down in verse 9, it says, Making known to us the mystery of His will, according to His purpose. And in verse 11, uh, it talks about our inheritance. So, but then it says, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will again. Over and over, it says, will, not our will, his will. Elsewhere, Paul points out the fact that grace that is earned isn't grace. And so all the talk about God's grace to us, if we earned it by choosing him, it's ultimately not grace. Now, the cons to our position are, first of all, that we can't comprehend exactly how it works, that God chooses and man is responsible to choose, and the two go together. We can apprehend, we can say, the scriptures say these things, they must be true, but we can't fully wrap our minds around it. And that's actually okay. If we had a God whose vision, whose purpose could fully grasp and wrap their mind around and say, I fully understand God, that would not be the God of the scriptures. A God who reveals himself to us well and as much as we need and beyond, but not fully. Our minds cannot fully grasp our God or his purposes. Another thing that's a con here is we can be charged with having a lack of motivation to evangelize. Well, if God has chosen his people, and for me to tell them about Jesus, because if they're going to be his people, then God's going to save them anyways. But there's two problems with this. First of all, that means we would be disobeying God's commandment to love our neighbor, to be ready to give them an answer, to live lives of blamelessness, holiness, and love before them. But also, secondly, just because God knows what he has decided doesn't mean any of us know. We are responsible to treat each and every person we see as one who might repent, one who might turn to our God. And then lastly, people led against the Reformed view of election that we can be prideful and God picked me because I'm great. And there's a couple problems with this. First of all, the only ones who can actually say that are everyone but the Reformed position who say people are good or people who made the right choice are chosen. In the Reformed position, it's completely undeserved. Like the scriptures say, God chose us in spite of who we are, in spite of our sin, in spite of our wickedness, in spite of our lack of interest in him and our cold hearts, he chose us and was good to us. And so there is nothing for us to be proud about in this. It is just God's mere good pleasure. And something to remember about election in the scriptures, and this is kind of our application for this section about choosing and predestining, it is a hard doctrine. It is something that can easily give offense to people. And if we wield it wrongly, if we go about proud and arrogant saying, I am chosen by God, yeah, we're going to alienate people. 
We're going to be disobeying our God who commands us to walk humbly before him. We're going to be misrepresenting the truth, and we're going to be misusing his word because every time predestination is brought up, it's brought up people who are suffering or who are about to suffer, who need to know that it's not their weak grasp on God that is holding them, but it is the grasp of God upon them. So the Ephesian church, a young church that's going to be facing trouble from people a lot better versed in theology than they are. When Paul can't go to them because he's bound in prison, to them he mentions election. No one was talking about election at the Jerusalem council. We were all together, the leaders of the church, the high and mighty. Election wasn't discussed there, at least not in the scriptures. It is for the weak, for the suffering, for those who need to know that God will hold you and take care of you. And that is how we should use it as well. In encouraging our own hearts when we are weak, that it's not our strength holding to him that saves us. In encouraging our brothers and sisters when they have lapsed into sin and repent, but still wonder, am I one of God's people or have I lost it? They can be faithful even when we are not. Then lastly here in the preparation for our salvation and God's work leading up to our coming his, we have verse 7. Verse 7 says, In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. So this redemption, we have this opportunity to turn from our children of God to inherit and be joint heirs with Christ. It is something that was paid for. It's called a redemption. And that redemption is made parallel to forgiveness of our sins. And now redemption isn't something we often talk about widely in culture. Pretty much the only time I've heard of it outside of the church is talking about bringing tin cans back to New York or Michigan. Uh, you can get a nickel or a dime back when you bring it in, and that's redeeming, and that's the only picture of it we have. But a better picture is of a slave who is owned or a prisoner of war who is being held. And they are released only when the ransom is paid. Only when they are bought out of that. And so before we had any interest in Christ, before we here were even born, God provided for the forgiveness of our trespasses, the forgiveness of our sins through the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. He paid the punishment that we deserved for our sins so that we could be made the children of God, that we could be brought into his family, that we could have all the benefits of being with him in glory. So brothers and sisters, our big application from today isn't any particular go and do this thing. It is just like Paul did here. Praise God. He has been absolutely fantastic to us. When we had he was good to us. And now when we struggle, we fail, he's still good. Praise God for his goodness to us in Christ. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your kindness to us. That you were good to us before you even said, let there be light. We thank you that our security does not depend on our faithfulness. It doesn't depend on our goodness, on our ability to comprehend the things that you have told us, to fully wrap our minds around all that you are, to do anything good. But everything in our salvation rests entirely on you. Thank you for being a faithful God to us. Please help us to remember to praise you before one another and even before the watching world that you would be glorified for the good things you have done for us. We ask these things in Jesus' name.